Welcome to our video on PRP centrifugation. We're going to talk about what happens to blood during centrifugation and how to determine the appropriate settings for your centrifuge when preparing platelet-rich plasma. In PRP preparation, we're interested in separating platelets from the blood. But blood has three other major components, red blood cells, white blood cells, and plasma. The other cellular components, red blood cells and white blood cells, differ markedly in size from platelets. The platelets are much smaller than the red blood cells or the white blood cells. Platelets also differ in density from other components. They're the lightest of all. The density difference, however, is not as marked as a size difference, and even under ideal conditions, there's overlap between white cell and platelet densities. Under real-world conditions, the overlap is significant. Nevertheless, differential centrifugation allows us to use these properties to separate platelets from whole blood. The success of this endeavor depends on three factors. The centrifugal force applied, the length of time the force is applied, and the viscosity of the blood. This graph shows a small study we did which looked at how much force it took to compress the red blood cell layer to its maximum. We took blood from nine volunteers and spun it at increasing force ranging from 100 g's to 600 g's for five minutes. You can see that the results were pretty uniform and that the curve had flattened by 550 g's. In principle, we can expect the same thing to happen to white blood cells and platelets, although the maximum force required will be different because of their different sizes and densities. In a completed centrifugation, you would see three discrete layers. The bottom layer is red cells, the top layer is plasma, and the middle layer, called the buffy coat, is platelets and white cells. Unfortunately, the platelet layer and the white cell layer are not visually distinguishable. This is not only because they're the same color, but also because their densities overlap and the two layers are still mixed together. In fact, we found that even after 15 minutes of centrifugation, the platelet layer still extends slightly into the red cell layer below the white cells. The same is true of the white cell layer. Even though you can't see it, it extends into the top of the red cell layer. This is why platelet yields from single spin methods are only in the 50 to 70 percent range. You simply can't get all the platelets out of the red cell layer without getting too many red cells in the PRP. The different blood components don't separate out during centrifugation at the same rate. Red blood cells settle pretty rapidly because they're most dense. After all, they're full of iron. We saw in the study mentioned above that with only 100 Gs for five minutes, they already had formed a discernible layer. But you won't see any buffy coat at these low Gs because this is not enough force to get the white blood cells to move very much, and the platelets don't move at all. In stage two, however, higher force and or longer time has an effect on the white cells and they begin to migrate toward their final destination, the buffy coat layer. But this is not a uniform migration because there are two populations of white blood cells, those in the plasma layer and those in the red cell layer. The plasma white cells move more quickly to the buffy coat because they're pushed by centrifugal force and have only the plasma to hinder their migration. The red cell layer white cells, on the other hand, move relatively slowly because they're opposed by the centrifugal force and they have to fight their way up through a dense mass of red blood cells. We think many remain in the red cell layer even after 15 minutes of centrifugation. With prolonged centrifugation and or higher forces, the platelets finally start to migrate to their density level, just above the white cells. They also have two populations, the plasma platelets and the red cell platelets, that migrate at different speeds. The platelets in the red cell layer have a little advantage over the white cells there since they're lighter and much smaller and can therefore move more easily between the red cells to get to the top of the layer. Nevertheless, we have found that within the time and centrifuge constraints that we have in the typical clinical situation, many of the platelets stay stuck in the red cell layer. That's why it's impossible to get PRP with 100% yield. We've done quite a bit of testing at different speeds and times and with different centrifuges. As a broad generalization, we can say that red cells settle out with about 100 g's of force for 5 minutes. White cells take about 400 g's for 10 minutes, and platelets require 1,000 g for 10 to 15 minutes.
there's a fair amount of variability, but these are reasonable numbers to start from. Most centrifuges are not calibrated in Gs, the unit of relative centrifugal force. So we need to be able to set the centrifuge in RPM, revolutions per minute. This is because the radius of each model of centrifuge is different, and the RCF is nonlinearly dependent on the radius. Thus, 1000 RPM on your centrifuge will not give the same g-force as 1000 RPM on my centrifuge. Fortunately, there is a relatively simple equation to convert g's into RPM. It requires only that you know the radius from the center of the centrifuge rotor to the target layer of the sample. We use one or two radii in PRP preparation, depending on what method we're using. Our mid is the radius from the rotor to the middle of the blood column where the Buffy coat will appear. This is used in single spin methods and in the first spin of two spin methods because the target layer in these cases is the Buffy coat layer. R max is the distance from the rotor to the bottom of the column of blood. It's used in the second spin of two spin methods because the target layer is the bottom of the plasma. To determine R mid on your centrifuge, first measure the distance from the center of the rotor to the top center of the sample container. We're calling this distance D1. If you're using syringes, you'll need to cut off the plungers and perhaps the flanges in order for them to fit into the centrifuge buckets. We use a pair of diagonal cutters like the ones pictured here. In our lab centrifuge, we've been able to successfully use 20, 30, and 60 cc syringes. Note that every brand of syringe is different, and even if they're the same capacity, say 20 cc's, the dimensions will differ. Here we see three different sizes of syringe placed in the buckets of a lab centrifuge. Measure the distance D1 from the center of the rotor to the tip of the cap of each syringe. Note that the tip of the 60 cc syringe in bucket 4 extends beyond the center of the rotor and thus the distance will be negative. Now measure the distance from the top of the sample container to the middle of the column of blood in the container. We'll call this D2. For syringes, we measure D2 from the tip of the cap to the middle of the column of blood in the barrel of the syringe. In this case, for instance, we're using a 20 cc syringe and we plan to use 1.5 cc of sodium citrate and then add 15 cc of blood for a total volume of 16.5 cc. Of course, the midpoint of the blood in the syringe will be half of that. 8.25 cc's. Again, the reason we need to know R mid is for compatibility between different centrifuge systems. When you've done it one time for a particular combination of centrifuge and sample container, you can record that value and you won't have to do it again. Once we know D1 and D2, we can calculate R mid. If you have a swing bucket centrifuge where the sample will spin horizontally, then it's easy. Just add D1 and D2. However, many people use test tube centrifuges, and these samples are usually spun at a fixed angle of 45 degrees. This complicates things, because now the radius from the top of the container to the middle of the blood is no longer D2, but the length of the leg of a 45 degree right triangle with a hypotenuse of length D2. However, if we dust off our old geometry book, we can see that we can easily calculate the real radius, it's just d2 divided by the square root of 2. Now we can calculate r mid. In this example, we've measured d1 at 47 millimeters and d2 at 69 millimeters. Plugging these values into the addition equation, we find that the r mid radius is 9.5 centimeters. Note that we have converted to centimeters because that's the unit that the conversion formula requires. The procedure for determining r max is much the same. First, measure D1, the distance from rotor to container top. Then, measure the distance from the top of the container to the bottom. This distance we will name D3. In syringes, measure the distance D3 from the tip of the cap to the plunger, assuming you evacuated all air from the syringe. In our 20cc syringe example, we know that it will be filled to 16.5 cc so we just have to measure to the 16.5 cc mark on the barrel.
Just like before, we can calculate our max for a horizontal centrifuge by just adding D1 and D3. And like before, we will calculate the radius for a 45 degree centrifuge by dividing D3 by the square root of 2 and then adding the result to D1. In this example, we know that D3 is 104 millimeters and D1 is 47 millimeters. Doing the math, we find that the R max in this case is 12 centimeters. And now we're finally ready to calculate the RPM setting for our centrifuge. Here's the formula again. Let's assume we're using a 45 degree fixed centrifuge for the first spin of a two spin method. We've measured and calculated our mid and found it to be 9 centimeters. We have decided to use 400 g's of force. If we enter these two values and solve the equation, we find that we need to set our centrifuge to 1,994 RPM. To make this even easier, you could use any of a number of RCF to RPM converters that are available on the internet, or you could use our app, PRPCalc, which is available free for Android or iPhone. We haven't said much about blood viscosity, because it's something we don't have any control over. If we could centrifuge samples for a long time, then viscosity wouldn't make any difference because eventually all the cell components would migrate to their appropriate layers. But in the clinic, our time is limited, and thus patients with high blood viscosity will generally have lower yields than ones with low viscosity. In the future, we may figure out how to compensate for this by increasing RCF, but we're not there yet. We have also not talked much about time. There's a trade-off between time and force. Longer spin times are equivalent to higher RCF to some extent. In the clinic, we're constrained in both variables since we have limited time and most clinical centrifuges can't generate much more than about 2,000 Gs, even at R max. Nevertheless, within these constraints, there's room for flexibility in determining the optimum settings for producing PRP with a given system. A little more about viscosity. Here we see a graph showing the relationship between viscosity, centrifugal force, and red blood cell compression. In this case, we used erythrocyte sedimentation rate as a surrogate marker for viscosity. We took blood samples from a number of patients, measured their sed rates, then spun their blood at nine different G levels for five minutes and measured how much each was compressed by measuring the amount of plasma produced. The bottom line, dark blue, represents the effects at 100 G. You can see that as sed rate increases, that is, as viscosity decreases, the amount of plasma produced increases. In other words, the red blood cells become more compressed at lower viscosities. At 100 Gs, this is a significant effect, about 30%. However, as you go up the graph to higher RCF, you'll notice that the viscosity effect decreases, and by 450 Gs, it hardly has any effect at all. The bottom line is that we can take advantage of the different size and density of blood components to use differential centrifugation to separate platelets from blood to produce platelet-rich plasma. The bad news is that this is not a perfect system. It's limited because of the overlapping densities of blood components, the effects of variable viscosity, and the fact that we're time-constrained in the clinic.